Good morning and welcome to the 2022 North Central Washington Apple Day. Before I get into my main topic this morning, I'd like to put in a plug for the Codling Moss Summit. This is a webinar coming on February 24th. The Codling Moth Task Force has assembled the top experts in the field of codling moth control and put them into an all day event. Registration is free, but you do have to register to attend. Since we have more content than we can fit into one day, we will also have some bonus content in the form of recorded videos that will be available on the WSU Tree Fruit website. So do please join us for this cast of all-star speakers. Before I start on the survey results, I thought you might be interested on the effects of last year's summers, uh, the 2021 summers, high temperatures on coddling moth model and degree days. This is a graphic illustration showing how many degree days are accumulated in a given day in relation to the upper and lower temperature thresholds. These are 50 and 88 degrees respectively. The thresholds are highlighted with dotted lines and the curve represents the sine curve we use to calculate degree days. The shaded blue area represents the total degree days for that day. In the left graph, this is a cool day in spring and only about five degree days are accumulated. Note that all the hours below the lower threshold accumulated nothing. In the right graph, the daily max and min are both above the lower threshold. In fact, the max and min are the two thresholds. And we get about 19 degree days in this situation. As the temperatures increase to midsummer, accumulations go up. Note, however, that when temps go above the upper threshold, the number of degree days accumulated stays the same or physiological time stays the same as if it were 88 degrees. And we get about 29 degree days in a day like that. When the temps ramp up a little bit more, we get more degree days per day, but not proportionately the same number because the horizontal cutoff is at the upper threshold. And just for fun, I picked the two hottest days um, this year at the Sunrise Research Orchard pardon me, this year in 2021. And those days were June 29th and 30th. The degree day accumulation was pretty similar, but the 29th, which had a higher nighttime low of 81 degrees, had a very slightly higher cum versus the 78 degrees on the 30th. Even though the daytime high on the 30th was the highest of the year, 116 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we still had more degree days the day before. So at least in degree day calculation, the Q is driven more by the nighttime low than the daytime high under very high temperatures. And here is our theoretical maximum uh, number of degree days when the low is above 88. That's the upper threshold. In this case, you get about 39 degree days. And by definition, that's the top end, that's all you can get. One consideration is that while the model calculates a constant maximum development during this period, temperatures above 90 to 95 degrees are detrimental to coddling moth development. It, um, it is this high a temperature where sustained, we would start to see mortality. But as long as temperatures fluctuate, the damage is likely minimal. And in addition, it is likely that coddling moth change their behavior to avoid lethal temperatures when possible. Okay, so now for my main topic this morning, I'm gonna spend some time going over the results of the survey hopefully many of you participated in uh, last winter. The survey was developed by the Coddling Moth Task Force, which is sponsored by the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission. There had been a growing sense of, well, let's say uneasiness about codling moth control. And we wanted to get a handle on the scope of the problem and also on industry practice for controlling codling moth. 
So first, a little bit about our survey respondents. We had about 178 total respondents, which is great. Thank you. Growers, managers, and consultants were well represented, and Apple and Pear were about equally represented in the survey, although Pear was somewhat overrepresented in, in terms of uh, the relative acreage. But overall, a solid turnout. We had a good distribution in terms of acres managed and also uh, a good representation of organic, conventional, and transitional acreage. So digging into the heart of the question, we asked, how often is damage at unacceptable levels? The sometimes category is a little ambiguous and not terribly dissimilar between the two and ditto for the category never. The biggest difference probably was in every year, which is quite a bit higher in organic, which is exactly what you would expect. Cotling moth management in organic is just harder. The other takeaway uh, we get from this result, or at least I get personally, is what is the priority of this problem for extension and outreach? If you never have a coddling moth problem, I don't need to help you. But if you do have one in some years or every year, which covers 70 to 80% of the respondents, it suggests there is room for improvement. We also asked what damage levels are quote unquote acceptable. This was a bit of a tricky question, and it relates back to the previous question of how often was damage at unacceptable levels. The majority of the respondents, 78%, indicated that zero or 1% was the acceptable level. More surprising to me was the 22% that indicated three to 12% was acceptable. In general, we'd like to manage to less than half a percent and preferably much lower than that. This is one of those questions where breaking out conventional versus organic responses would be helpful since you generally need to revise your expectations in an organic lock. In terms of canopy architecture, this response will not come as a surprise to most of the audience, but the highest pressure blocks are typically our older plantings where there are more places for coddling moth larvae to cocoon and the canopy is more three-dimensional and harder to get spray coverage. However, no planting system makes you immune from coddling moth pressure because so many factors are involved. But this result certainly hints that spray coverage may be a big part of our problem. One thing the task force was very interested in was the trend in cobbling moth injury. Was it getting better or worse? There was some sense that it was getting worse, which was the reason for the formation of the task force. But the results of the survey really don't bear this out. Only 25% of the respondents felt it had gotten worse. The other three quarters felt it was unchanged. Variable, no specific trend, or even decreased. So there is an indication, we do need to keep uh, paying attention to this, but it's not the three alarm fire that we thought it was. We broke out the trend data by apple and pear and surprisingly, there was not much difference between the two. The problem is similar apparently in both crops. This is a bit surprising since coddling moth prefer apples over pears, especially a winter pear like an angel. Here's another pretty diagnostic question. Even if you haven't experienced more damage, has it cost you more to keep damage from increasing? This is a second indirect way at getting at increasing pressure. And this is likely how growers and fieldmen will respond to more pressure with intensified management. However, in all fairness, this is confounded with increasing costs of materials and labor and it's hard to tease those two apart. And it's likely some combination of the two. So it's safe to say 
that almost no one thinks the cost of control is going down. Another indicator of pretty extreme pressure is if you felt damage was so high in your organic block that you had to switch it back to conventional to clean it up. There may be some other factors at play here like the cost of organic controls and the price of organic fruit. But regardless, only 11% of the survey respondents said they had changed an organic block back to conventional because of coddling moth. We also asked about the barriers to implementing IPM. This response was a little surprising. The majority of respondents did not feel that there were any barriers and presumably had a fully functional IPM program. The rest of the responses uh, were more or less evenly divided between the other choices or what we call our lack of list. So yes, these other factors do play a role, but it's hard to pick out just one and say, here's the one we need to be working on. One issue that keeps coming up is how many traps people put out. And I'm addressing that in my next talk also. I've grouped these by apple versus pear, but actually the results are pretty similar. The majority of those polled had one trap every five to 10 acres, which is honestly about what we expected. A very small minority did not trap at all, surprising, uh, or at very low densities. Pear growers were slightly less inclined than apple growers to trap at the recommended density of one trap every two and a half acres. And the 22% rate uh, that traps at the recommended rate is actually pretty good. So just for fun, I compared the online survey to the informal polls we did at last year's meeting. And spoiler alert, we're going to do the same thing again this year. We asked the question in a slightly different way, but um, in general, the Apple Day participants responded about the same as the online survey respondents. So you're a pretty representative audience. So that's the quick summary of the survey. There is a wealth of additional detail. Um, and again, many thanks to the Tree Fruit Research Commission for making the survey possible. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Vince Jones who walked me through some of those extreme examples of degree day calculation. I think the survey has given us some insights we didn't have before and a baseline to implement change in the future. We're still working on the results and hope to have a more detailed analysis and write up in the future. Thank you.